Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to an FS Club seminar on a deep topic in finance, the pretty much the wholesale plumbing arrangements. And we have today with us Kathleen Tyson and Martin Watkins, two experts who are going to be leading us through uh, central counterparties. Uh, central counterparties, or CCPs as they're known, uh, do face a number of crises, uh, but uh, a number of risks, and uh, we will be looking at some of the resolutions. This is all in line with the fact that there is a Financial Stability Board consultation paper out at the moment, which closes at the end of the month. And hopefully this will give you some perspectives for those of you who might feel like writing a letter to the consultation, uh, give you a bit of perspective about what others are thinking on the subject. Now, most of you will know me. I'm Michael Minelli. I'm the executive chairman of CN Group. And it really is my privilege to be able to present these FS Club webinars. And I say privilege because our sponsors listed here, uh, numerous uh, financial centers around the world, technology firms and financial services firms, let us range widely and freely on technology, economics, finance, uh, and often with a social purpose. And today we're going to be looking at kind of what, what, what role do CCPs play? The agenda today is uh, fairly straightforward. Kathleen and Martin are going to give you a fairly rapid uh, and deep tour of the sector and what's going on in it uh, before sharing some thoughts on their opinions on what should be done. We have about 25 minutes for questions today, we hope, 20 to 25, and I think it should be a, a good rip-roaring and rollicking uh, session. Would you please use the GoToWebinar question facility uh, if you email me a response, I'm afraid I'm on the webinar, so I, I won't see it until after we get off. Uh, but the facility is really quite straightforward. Just type your questions in there, and I will be fielding them to Kathleen and Martin as appropriate. Now, Kathleen is going to kick off first, uh, and Martin is going to follow her. Um, and Kathleen, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. Um, and welcome, everybody. Uh, it's good to be back with the Financial Services Club. I am going to start with some brief prefatory marks and some ancient history because it's actually really super relevant to the trends that we're seeing today. I started my career with CCPs in crisis. I joined the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in May 1987. I was told I was responsible for futures options and swaps, and I asked, what are those? The response was, we're not sure. Buy some books and find out. So on my lunch hour, I went and bought some books. Chicago, Kathleen Mark, my apologies. We've had a small uh, problem here. We're just going to restart if that's okay. My apologies. Uh, uh, audience members out there, we're just uh, just going to kick back and restart the first three minutes. If you might, my my sincere apologies there. Uh, anyway, good day everyone and welcome to FS Club. Uh, for those of you who uh, are interested in today's topic, it's a topic that's going to be looking very much at the deep plumbing of financial services. We're going to be looking at central counterparties, CCPs, as they're known in the trade. We're going to be examining uh, some of the crises that they've been through, the risks that they pose, and some of the resolutions uh, that might lie ahead. What makes it particularly interesting, of course, is that the Financial Stability Board has a consultation paper out, which we'll be recording at, uh, sorry, which is uh, due for responses by the end of this month, July. And so a number of you out there might find today's session useful in seeing what the terrain entails and forming your own thoughts on what you might reply. Uh, one of the great things about being executive chairman of the club is getting to deliver a whole variety of webinars like this. And it's really only due to our sponsors who, as you can see here, are wide ranging uh, themselves uh, from financial centers through technology firms and financial services firms. And they let us explore all sorts of topics on uh, finance, uh, economics, technology, and often with social purpose. And today, uh, we're certainly going to be in home country here as we explore some of the deep issues in the area of central counterparties. Uh, today's session has got about 25 minutes of presentation uh, by Kathleen Tyson and Martin Watkins, two experts in the area. And we are going to be listening to them for a bit as they go through the issues as they see them and also some of their own personal thoughts on the subject. There's plenty of time for you to ask questions, so please do use the GoToWebinar facility. Uh, if you type your question, I will field it to Kathleen or Martin as appropriate. Uh, please don't email me the question. I'm here online with you and won't see it until afterwards, so just use the questionnaire facility. Uh, and now, if I would may, I'd like to hand over to our team, 
and I believe Kathleen is kicking off first. Kathleen. Thank you, Michael. It's good to be back with Financial Services Club. Um, and this is a great topic because I started my career with CCPs in crisis. Uh, I'm going to start with a brief preface that goes into some of the history because that is really driving some of the issues around resources and resolution that we're going to be looking at later with the Financial Stability Board uh, papers. Um, I joined the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in 1987. In June, I was told I was responsible for futures options and swaps. I asked what those were. The officer said, we're not sure, buy some books and find out. Back then, Chicago was a very long way from New York. I bought some books and started reading. The Chicago Board Options, options Exchange was founded to trade stock options just five years before that, in 1982, by the legend in part of the, the one, several of the founders were the O'Connor brothers, who were legends in Chicago, uh, Billy and Eddie. They always traded the limit, the highest amount in the pits. And um, they also founded the first options clearinghouse back in 1973. So interest rate and index options came a couple of years later. Um, like today's investment banks, the O'Connors diversified through a number of trading vehicles. Uh, this diversification gave them a lot more influence. They founded O'Connor and Associates in 1977 under a CEO who was Michael Greenbaum, who had been the head of risk management at the first options clearinghouse. So he knew the internal CCP margin model. And O'Connor and Associates soon became the biggest arbitrager in every Wall Street equities deal. And it internally modified the Black-Scholes model for options pricing, first monthly, then daily, then in real time. Stocks roared to multi-year bull run highs in the 1980s, um, despite concerns that the values were completely disconnected from fundamentals and performance. And that should sound familiar to anyone looking at the markets today. Um, the O'Connors detected volatility in their models and so could anticipate fat tail events. And indeed, they anticipated the October 87 market crash. They were hard selling into the markets on Friday. And that led to mammoth margin calls in Chicago on Monday morning. Now, the way margin calls work, variation margin are uh, high quality liquid assets and cash that are used as a buffer against volatility on one day's trading for the clearinghouse. And then variation margin is cash only that gets paid through the clearinghouse from losers to winners. And that usually happens daily, but it can happen intraday in volatile conditions. And on October Black Monday, 1987, we had volatile conditions. So insiders anticipating the margin calls sold hard at the open. Index arbitrage and pro program trading sold procyclically down during the day. So Chicago got lower, New York got lower, Chicago got lower, New York got lower. And those hit with margin calls had no choice but forced selling into illiquid declining markets. The forced selling resulted in more intraday margin calls in Chicago in the morning and the afternoon in what's now known as a doom loop. Market maker liquidity collapsed in New York because the dealers just gave up trying to intermediate the securities markets. There was no price discovery, which is the whole point of markets. New York clearing banks began to panic because they ran out of money to meet the margin calls from Chicago, and they worried about lending more to their clients. At that point, I was brought into the office of the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. I mean, this is my, you know, I'd been in the bank maybe three, four months. And I had to explain to him about initial margin and variation margin because he knew nothing about Chicago clearing. I explained that the variation margin, the cash that was coming out of New York banks, would go to Chicago, but it would come back to New York within the hour because the clearing process in Chicago would take it from the losers, pay it to the winners, and it would come back as liquidity into the system again. So he called the banks. He told them to keep lending. And the next day, Alan Greenspan made a very brief statement, which I'm going to read in full because this is the start of the Fed as market maker of last resort and quantitative easing. The Greenspan statement in its entirety is, quote, the Federal Reserve, consistent with its responsibilities as the nation's central bank, affirmed today its readiness to serve as a source of liquidity to support the economic and financial system, end quote. 
The market soared by more than 100 points within seconds. The crisis righted itself. And that was the beginning of central bank liquidity bailouts. And the central bank is market maker of last resort. So what I learned, Black Monday, 1987, is that financial derivatives are, are actually prone to severe price dislocations in stressed markets. Those repricings lead to CCP margin calls as both increases in initial margin to compensate for increased volatility and also as variation margin calls to redistribute cash from the losers to the winners. And those margin calls lead to forced selling and opportunistic short selling into the stressed markets in a pro-cyclical manner and that's particularly led by those who have the best view of the margin models. And that leads to ever more margin calls and more force selling in a doom loop up to the point where the central bank says they will provide infinite liquidity. And again, that should begin to sound familiar because we've just seen that again recently. So if I learned that lesson in Chicago in 1987, O'Connor Associates knew it before I did. And they not only survived the 1987 crash, they thrived, they globalized the model of dominating derivatives market making, dominating hedge funds, and dominating clearing operations. They merged with Swiss Bank Corporation. The management of SBC was completely replaced with the management of O'Connor Partners. It was like a reverse takeover. And then the O'Connor Partners spread and became CEOs of almost every powerful investment bank in the world. It was really quite an amazing period in, in the early 90s. Um, they took over most of the investment banks here in London. So um, that model globalized very, very rapidly and spread derivatives trading and CCPs globally. So CCPs grew ever more central to this expansion of financial derivatives, but no one ever discussed the doom loop. The doom loop isn't a bug, it's a feature. If you want to force central banks to create new money, it's very easy just threatened to bring down the clearinghouse. So imagine my surprise when in 2009, Bill Dudley, then the president of the New York Fed, tells the world the answer to a great financial crisis that started with post-war highs of equity overvaluations underpinned by bad mortgage underwriting, worse mortgage-backed securitizations, misleading credit ratings, and wide repackaging of CDOs that were sold as bank capital globally, was that OTC financial derivatives should all be cleared through CCPs. And they should be margined daily. Okay. That was a surprising policy recommendation. But the G20, the BIS, EOSCO, they all went along with it and they rolled out mandatory margin for OTC derivatives in 2012. At the time, it was promoted as, uh, well, prudent risk management. It was legislated in Dodd Frank and in EMIR in Europe. So following Lehman's collapse, which, by the way, cost British custody clients more than 32 billion in custody assets. All of the asset managers and hedge funds concentrated clearing margin and collateral in a smaller and smaller cadre of too big to fail dominant dealer banks. These banks sit on the market committees of the central banks and they sit on the margin committees of the CCPs. So this is really the COVID crisis is the first crisis to test this new highly concentrated system. Um, so now we're going to look at how that performed. Um, I'll just point out that it started in February with new all-time highs in leverage and PE ratios and new all-time highs in some of the securities indexes. But the stress in the system had already been detected in, in 2019 because the Fed had already rolled out new repo facilities in 2019, which was the not QE. Um, to support primary dealers in New York. So there was stress in the system before the crisis, and then the crisis obviously um, created more difficulty. Now, the way that recovery and resolution is uh, managed at CCPs, the first level is preparation and prevention. This is having, uh, having appropriate levels of initial margin, variation margin at least daily, and then a recovery plan in case of problems. And the problem, the most obvious problem, of course, is a clearing member default or a, a major default by a, a major asset manager or client. All these plans are reviewed by supervisors and national authorities have the power to intervene if there is a CCP in difficulty. Uh, at the end, there's a process 
for resolution, but that has not been used by any CCP yet. It's unlikely it ever would be used because the knee-jerk reaction is always to bail them out. Um, it's always cheaper to bail them out than to let them fail, as we learned with Lehman. So um, let's go to the next slide. Most of the discussion now about reforms involves skin in the game because the, the market has become so highly concentrated that the top dealing firms as clearing members have extreme exposure to their clearing houses. And it's almost impossible for the clearing houses to manage the risk of any one of those dominant firms, much less two of those dominant firms defaulting, which is the, the, the standard model for um, uh, stress scenarios. Um, above that, CCPs are very profitable. Um, they, have, they have very low equity, but they have a very high return on equity. And the BIS has concluded that if they had more skin in the game, they might be more prudent in their modeling and risk management. So that's a lot of the discussion that's going forward. Next. The way um, CCPs discuss their risk management is in a waterfall of loss allocation. And that waterfall can go to clearing members first, but can also go to uh, the underlying stakeholders that are holding positions through clearing members. So what the top CCP members are seeking in waterfall reforms, and this is a process that started before the crisis, they began publishing their wish list of reforms in October 2019, which means that it was a process that was started significantly in advance of that. And what they're looking for is more CCP skin in the game to make draws on the members a last resort, a member ballot of any recovery of a fail, failing CCP, uh, if the failing CCP wants more than the default fund contributions that have been pre-agreed. They want compensation for any losses that they have to bear from future profits of the CCP. And if they are ever forced to bail in and recapitalize the failed CCP, they want the equity. They want to end up owning it. So that's quite a wish list, and it would significantly change the structure of the way waterfalls work. The uh, the graphic is going to be too small to read there probably, but the typical CCP waterfall is on the left, and the proposed waterfall, that's the wish list for the major clearing banks and asset managers in the world, is on the right. Next. So let's look how the clearing houses performed in the crisis, because they actually did they did exactly what they're supposed to do. They sucked in a huge amount of initial margin to accommodate volatility, and then they sucked in an even huger amount of variation margin to redistribute um, wealth from losers to winners. Um, here, this, this graph comes from a recent paper by the CCP12, which is at ccp12.org, and it shows a massive spike in cleared volumes at all the clearing houses and in all the asset classes because asset prices globally repriced going into the COVID crisis. And um, record highs were reached in mid-March as the crisis hit its worst phase. So most affected was equities, um, where there was just a mammoth increase in volumes and volatility. But it all, all of the sectors were affected by this crisis, which is a bit unusual. Usually financial crises are located by geography or by sector, but this really did hit everything. Next slide. Now, there was a doom loop, and I'm, it's not just me saying this, this is the term that Andy Haldane used in looking at the crisis. He said it was a classic doom loop um, that was particularly driven by hedge funds. Um, who hedge funds were forced to liquidate positions that they held before the crisis once they reevaluated their strategies, but also they were they had to raise huge funds during the crisis to cover co mar margin calls and anticipate future volatility. So all markets became less liquid. Um, dealers backed away from them. Even the U.S. Treasury market froze up, so that in mid March. The Federal Reserve was forced to intervene. They announced QE4 and they relaxed dealer capital limits. Next. There was a massive dash for cash. Liquidity was king and um, uh, variation margin has to be in cash. So people were hoarding it. 
because they couldn't know what the next call was going to be. They were hoarding cash, and that led to high concentrations among those institutions with preferential access to central bank funds, but also their preferred clients and counterparties to whom they had the biggest exposures. And everybody else was marginalized. Um, and that happens in every crisis. It's nothing new, but it is particularly destabilizing to uh, mid-tier, smaller counterparties and um, emerging markets and developing economies. So, um, yeah, next. Right. Uh, this is the, the, the this, this slide I really like. The little black bars at the bottom were the increases in initial margin. And what I like about this, and this is only on the U.S. Treasury front month futures, is that the black bars are actually quite modest. The CCP did not have to adjust its initial margin by very much, and it did it in staggered portions. However, the variation margins were huge. Um, and that, um, that then triggered because it caused the liquidity crisis, it triggered QE4, which was announced uh, the week of March 16th. And then the following week, because the market was still under extreme stress, the Federal Reserve announced that QE4 was unlimited. And they also announced that they would be buying impaired corporate debt. And that led to a very rapid market recovery. All asset prices zoomed back positive, And we've been seeing uh, indexes hit new highs ever since. So QE4 forever, yay. Next. Now, part of what's driving all of this is an increase in concentration risk. Following the 2008 crisis, there was a mammoth increase in concentration uh, into the top dealers, so that the top five dealers now are more than half the market, and the top 10 dealers are more than 75% of the market. And then the little chart, uh, over to, to the right shows the decline in the absolute number of uh, dealers in, in derivatives in the U.S. They're called futures commission merchants in the U.S. And, and their number has declined from more than 170 down to less than 100. So that's a really stark concentration of the market in a very short span of time. And that's difficult because it's very difficult for the CCP to manage the risk of any one of those top 10 firms failing. And so the, the, the costs and the, the burdens of managing the risk become almost unmanageable because there is no liquidity elsewhere in the market with the mid-tier firms squeezed out. Next. So the FS Financial Stability Board is consulting on resources and resolution. Um, it's a good workmanlike consultation. Uh, they're looking at stress scenarios. They're looking at existing resources and tools, how, how any resolution costs might be assessed, looking for gaps and evaluating means to address the gaps. Uh, and then they're looking at the treatment of CCPs and resolution because there's different laws, different methods in every country. What I would say there is that the biggest gap, what is mess missing is any analysis of increasing market and clearing member concentrations for CCP risk management, CCP resolution, because if those top five dominant dealers were to participate in a bail-in resolution and get the equity of the CCP as compensation, then they would have perfected the O'Connor model that allowed the O'Connor brothers to dominate Chicago and dominate financial futures 30 years ago. Martin. That's a yeah, there are a number of resources which will be available on the slides when they go up. Um, and Martin, uh, yes, over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Michael. It's a pleasure to be uh, presenting to FS Club. And Kathleen, thank you for a very detailed uh, run through. I'm looking to build on it. Um, and so uh, so I may leverage one or two of the points that, uh, that Kathleen has already made. Um, might even disagree with one or two at the same time, um, but I do that at my uh, at my peril. Um, so Martin Watkins, I'm the chief executive of Cornswood Group. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, 25 or just over 25 years in the industry. Um, I actually um, uh, come from having come into the city working in the insurance market, the Lloyd's of London insurance market. And if you, for those of you who may recall what happened with asbestosis claims and so on, um, 
have become rather familiar with with major market shifts um, and the potential for significant uh, failures. Um, but I've been working with CCPs and also with CSDs since 1995. Uh, when I started by helping to get uh, LCH uh, ready for Crest. Um, and I've gone on to work uh, in London, New York, Brussels and Paris um, with CCPs and CSDs. Um, and what I wanted to do here today was to, to start by taking the, the, the journey and, and the discussion that, that Kathleen's been talking about um, and actually putting it into another dimension, another lens, which is seeing what's happening in parallel from a CCP perspective. Now, Kathleen um, talked about the G20 leaders uh, declaration, or she talked about the, uh, the, the drive for everything to be centrally cleared and the impact then that we saw from Dodd-Frank and EMEA. Um, but we'd already had um, from post 9-11, uh, the Fed Reserve Bank supervisory letter, we'd had, we had the setting out of a requirement for a much closer scrutiny and a much closer understanding of what was happening in the, in the clearing and settlement FMUs from a US point of view or FMIs from over here, financial market infrastructures. Um, and this was very much at the time that, that firms were, that, that infrastructure players were starting to have to look at their own position. What were they running? What were their systems? What was their capability? And what was their position in terms of protecting and growing their business? Um, it also came at a time of, of quite significant uh, competition in the early 2000s um, and the drive for growth. Now, that drive for growth also had at the trading venue side, uh, some issues on competition, which were start to be addressed by MIFID 1 being brought out here in Europe. And we'd seen in the US what had happened with uh, ECNs and ATSs and so on. Um, but where that got us to was a point whereby we start to see um, regulations and guidelines being issued for the running and the operations of the CCPs which at the same time as they've got to deal with the business side, they've got to deal with the technology operations and also the underlying internals. I refer here first to what was going on with cybersecurity. Um, you imagine we're talking about the complexity of the, of the margin models. We're talking about the, the uh, way in which CCPs and the clearing members are constructed. At the same time, you've got uh, requirements for them to put in very detailed um, internal systems and capability. Now, that was pretty uh, pretty okay if you were doing it just for your for just for your own central counterparty, or you'd probably do it because of the way you develop systems and so on. Probably do it just for your own product set. Take that a stage further, and you start to get into the uh, the post-economic crisis, post-2008, um, there was much more focus at this stage on how did you understand the your role amongst your peer group. Kathleen talked about the concentration risk. The concentration risk um, was also one there of how much did you depend on each other? How much was it that a particular central counterparty may require May, may expect other members of the ecosystem to operate in a stressed environment. And similarly, how did those other participants behave? And therefore, the interconnectedness and interoperability of different firms became rather key. Um, that first came out in uh, the CPMI OSCO cyber resilience uh, requirements of 2016 and then the uh, European Central Bank ones of 2018. Um, and that was a dependency of, of having some understanding of your peer group. But that's gone on. And we saw in the OCIR, the Operational Continuity and Resolution Regulations for Banks, where there was an additional focus on did the banks understand and did they have enough knowledge of what the their, their underlying CCPs and CSDs would do and what strategic intent was in the event of a stressed environment. 
That's come out in the latest series of papers, which I think very much sits in parallel with the FSB consultation paper on the, uh, the guidance of financial resources, is actually, do you also understand those that you work with? And do you, do you understand what their performance is going to be in a stressed environment? Now, against that background, you have to then look at what's going on with uh, the uh, with with margins, and as as Kathleen has already mentioned, there was already a um, significant volatility going on in the market. Now, the thing behind here is, as Kathleen talked of us moving out of eighty seven and so on when when she first got involved uh, to to looking at the the way it's approached now is it's much more mechanical now. And we have the fact that large price movements will mechanically trigger large variation margins. It's a process. It will happen. It's driven without needing to take time to think about the consequences, because actually we're into a much more rules based and much more driven regulatory environment. It means that if you're in a loss making position, you're going to get hit by variation margin calls, potentially intraday. You're going to also suffer capital losses. And as, as a result, you're going to see that your leverage ratio is going to increase. And that gets to your forced positions and forced sales, which creates, as, as Kathleen was saying, that doom loop. Now, that doesn't mean that it was wrongly constructed. What it means is we, uh, we've got a set of tools and those tools drive a particular type of behavior. Now, if we can uh, look look here on the uh, the second chart, the CCP deposits, what it's actually meant is that there's, the CCPs have ended up with very large amounts to deposit, and they deposited at the central banks. The example here being the Fed. Now I remember back to uh, the Lehman's uh, uh, period uh, in 2008 of the Lehman's crisis, and what we had there were that the banks were dropping large amounts of collateral and cash into the CCPs and the CCPs themselves and the CSDs had to put it somewhere else. And logically, you'd then go to the central banks. And part of the challenge that that then creates is you then start creating not for the larger central banks necessarily, but for some of the mid tier central banks, you created a credit crisis because they then have to exchange for uh, central bank money. And you've got a challenge that what is the credit rating that you then apply against a central bank in the situation that they are now having large deposits placed on them. And you then start to get to the point, as we've uh, heard Kathleen talking about having the central bank intervention, you're now having CCPs having to make certain judgments around what haircuts to apply to sovereign debt in with the same uh, countries and the same central banks who in a stressed environment and one move into resolution may actually be asked to intervene to help them. Um, so if I can just go back just one little bit on that, Michael, if I can. Thank you. Um, when we then also look at it in respect of the initial margin and the initial margin I'm picking up here is that required for equity. You see the, the vast increase in the third chart there of what happened in uh, following COVID and the significant um, initial margin requirements uh, more than doubled in that situation. And if you look to the right hand side to the fourth chart, you see how that spread across the Asian market um, as, a, as a particular spread. Thank you, Michael. If we pick up to the next one. So in the stressed environment, we, we obviously are looking here at one measure of, of the cost and, and the cost of this is, is or one measure of the liquidity squeeze is actually the collateral cost. And that's, of course, coming through pricing. Um, Kathleen mentioned about the role of CCPs in collecting and distributing variation margin. But one of the other aspects to consider in this is actually there's a time lag, a time lag between when it's received and collected and when it's actually distributed out. And that in itself also adds uh, an aggregate form of, of impact on liquidity um, in terms of how that works. That, of course, then needs to flow through the whole of the system. And in this case, you're ostensibly dealing with the high 
quality liquidity assets being the ones that are most cherished, which are the ones which are held in the most concentrated form with the fewest players. So we're sitting here looking at the fact of the third chart where we can see that the analysis was performed in this case by the BIS for the high quality liquid assets. And it gives the impression quite rightly that you know, commercial banks had good liquidity um, they had good high quality assets in general to meet their meet their liabilities, but there were two particular large bank large dealer banks there who had a large exposure but a high uh, high quality liquidity asset and we've seen what some of the implications can be there. I then go over to the to the fourth chart on the on the right hand side and you can begin to see there that in terms of the cash assets. You've got you've got the banks who can will hoard the HQLA um, in anticipation of the um, of the margin calls that are going to be coming. And between, as that chart shows, between the end of Feb and early April, you've seen actually here there's an absolute doubling of the um, of the cash held by the uh, sorry of the of the of the of the cash held by the U.S. commercial banks, going from about 780 790 billion dollars to just under $1.5 billion. So Michael, if we can move to the last slide on this, please. I think from, from my perspective, therefore looking at this, it's looking at additional components which lead to the real, real world economic impact. Building on what Kathleen has already been saying, it's very clear that tools in place, they have a role, they have a purpose and so on but they've all got trade-offs. They've all got certain degrees of disadvantage. And you can look at some of the, some of the elements that come into play there. Um, you also need to look, and it's something we haven't touched on so much so far, which is the concentration of product. We talked about the concentration of clearing member, but the concentration of product. Where is the long end of the yield curve clear? Where is the short end cleared? Both Kathleen and I uh, come from a time of, of when you used to have the long end and the short end uh, split between CBOT and CME. It's now in one organ. It's, it's now in one exchange group, and you could see that elsewhere around the world as products get acquired uh, within different groups. Uh, we've seen that HKEX took the metals clearing away from LCH and create. Sorry, LME took it away in creating LME Clear, and that's now part of HKEX. You know, ICE have acquired Life. Um, and LCA, uh, LSE have now acquired the vast majority of LCH. So we're seeing a, a strengthening of the concentration of those particular products, which sits alongside uh, the concentration of the clearing members. COVID-19 has redefined what also can be considered as severe but plausible. So when you then start to look at it, it is quite natural that you'll end up in a circumstance of uh, pressure on the market driving uh, CCPs to look and say, have they asked for enough initial margin? And as the loop starts to develop on the, on the variation margin, it is a continual cycle of increasing and upping the level of, of margin that's actually being called in very stressed environments. Ultimately, who's paying the price down the line? It is the corporates and it is the asset managers, the pension funds who are going to suffer, who are suffering. Um, and there are very real examples at the moment where the corporates are facing the level of margin calls, which legally in the contracts that they've signed, they have to pay. But they had not planned for this type of eventuality and some are under severe uh, pressure and could, in fact, go out of business as a consequence, not of CCPs or the market behaving inappropriately, but because of the consequences of how this is set up and the fact that from a corporate's point of view, they may have understood that there was the liability that they'd have to have to pay the calls, but they're coming at a level that they hadn't previously expected or planned for. Ultimately, when we come back to the FSB paper and the consideration there, this is why it is important to get all the different factors in uh, in and to give the right level of response is because the challenge that we've got here is how to bring this to a level of proportionate approach, which means that financial service markets and the CCP and the role it performs can actually support 
the entire ecosystem in which which is dependent upon CCPs. And Michael, I'll hand back to you at that stage. Wow. Well, Kathleen and Martin, thank you both very much. Uh, a tough and deep subject, and uh, we don't have time to handle all of the questions that are out there, but I'd like to get cracking with a few. Uh, a quick one, uh, really, Kathleen, to you from Richard Metcalf is, so if the doom loop is such a clear and present danger, why is it not underway now, given market volatility? Okay, well, thank you, Richard. The doom loop only occurs when there's a pro-cyclical uh, spiraling down between the derivatives and the underlying. And it particularly hits its nadir, its bottom, when dealers in the underlying in securities, uh, whether they're treasuries or equities or commodities, cannot make a price because they have no assurance of whether that price will be valid the next millisecond or whether there will ever be another buyer that would take the asset off of them because they're under capital uh, um, constraints uh, that were imposed by Basel II. So um, in this crisis, the doom, loom, the doom loop ended when the Federal Reserve announced QE4 and announced that it would buy distressed assets, including corporate debt and ETFs, because nobody bets against the Fed under those circumstances, whether it's the Greenspan put, the Bernanke put, the Yellen put, or the Powell put, you don't bet against the Fed. And that's why the market has reflated to pre-crisis levels in most of those asset classes. Okay. Well, you've uh, woken the audience up to uh, doom and gloom and spirals, uh, as you were going on, Martin, as well. So, uh, And also their history lessons. So we've got quite a few questions out here. Uh, let me take one uh, from Jane. If the COVID-19 crisis turns out to be a lot worse than markets are currently expecting, I envisage severe pressure on commercial property and insurance sectors. That feels very different to previous crises, such as 1987 and 2008. Does the CCP central bank last resort model still work in the COVID doom scenario? Uh, Martin, do you want to kick off on that one? Yeah, I'll kick off on that one. And I, I think the answer is that the, the consequence of it not working is, is not thinkable for the politicians. And therefore, what you'll find is you'll find a form of intervention being achieved of which we may not understand quite what the overall consequences are. And I sort of pick up on here that you could in fact find that the central banks are under pressure to intervene to support the, to support things and will end up with instruments which are perhaps a hundred year in duration to finance the consequences of it. And so so within that, do I think that we'll get to a point of, of um, being out of control? No, but I think we know we'll, controls and, and tools will be applied, but we won't necessarily know how the whole thing will play out and it will be an expensive long game to achieve. So a return to the old perpetuals. <laughs> ah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I so. I, Martin's absolutely right. The Fed has already been talking about 100-year uh, treasury. Um, and they have, in fact, monetized all more than $2 trillion of federal debt that have been issued in 2020 has already been monetized with QE4. Um, on Particularly on insurance, real estate, um, and I would add pensions, because pensions have been performing negatively in the UK since before the crisis. Um, uh, I do think that there, we're, we're in uh, this crisis is going to be an epochal change politically, a wake-up call in a lot of ways, um, and that governments will, I would like to see governments have diverse policies to sort it out, because I think harmonization is partly why we have such a severe global crisis. The harmonization of BIS and EOSCO standards has actually meant that we don't have the diversity to see what works and what doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. So I would hope that at least in fiscal policy, we see governments taking a variety of approaches so we can actually see and learn from each other as to what works and what doesn't work. I would expect real estate is going to have to be supported because in the UK, the, the biggest political risk is a decline in house prices. And it's always been that way. Um, no, no party in power ever wants to see that. Um, and I think the crisis will be concentrated in commercial real estate in the UK, uh, just because uh, home working is probably here to stay in some form or other. And a lot of banks are already looking to move out of the, the high density cities. Um, and 
it's going to take decades to rebalance where we were in 2019 against where we're going to be going forward. Um, the, uh, it's going to be fiscal decisions. Just uh, slipping along here, uh, and I think it's an extension of uh, Jane's previous question in a way, and probably I'll start again with you, Martin, if I might. Uh, Ian in Halifax here, in terms of government and central bank lending of last resort, does there come the point where the value of QE that would be required makes the principle of infinite intervention unworkable? Uh, what value might uh, might yield such a death rather than a uh, doom spiral, and what happens next in such a spiral? Martin? So that's a bit I, of the perpetual, I think. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I think the element here is, is does it reach a point whereby it's, uh, it's almost indefensible, the use of it? Well, the reality is um, we've seen that, that, that uh, with Fannie Mae and, and Ginny Mac, that, um, uh, Freddie Mac, that, uh, that you can have uh, a service which is provided to the economy on the basis that it can't afford to fail. It is so pivotal. So from my perspective, as, a, as, a, as an intervention, you would always see that a government or groups of governments will come together. I'm thinking here about the ECB or people like that, and they will make a level of intervention which, which uh, is over and beyond anything else expected. If you sit back and say, does it look logical? No. Is it logical that the US has $15 trillion of debt? No, it's not logical. But at the same time, it is there and it's one of the components that actually we're working with. So the level of, 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 of QE that's going on at the moment, uh, I, I don't anticipate there'll be vast amounts more, but that if it was needed, I would see it happening. Um, Kathleen, there's a question here for you. It's uh, from John Falk. CCPs have failed before, and given the numbers and comments from Kathleen in her last three slides, how likely does she think a major CCP failure uh, is? You know, and could it occur with another major market event? And if it were a major CCP, what would the impact be? I, I don't think a CCP will be allowed to fail, ever. I think it would have central bank support, even from multiple central banks if necessary, um, uh, until they could work out a lifeboat for a bail-in from the stakeholders. And that is, in fact, what the resolution proposals from the Financial Stability Board call for. They call for national authorities to intervene and support until the resolution can be arranged by bail-in. Um, so that is the plan, and that is intended to prevent a, a failure. I, I assume you're referring to Hong Kong with the big CCP failure, because that was, that was the one I can think of. Um, I would also like to make the point that even going into this crisis, 30% of sovereign debt was negative yielding, and this crisis has brought yields down further. Um, uh, none of us really knows how capitalism works when yields are negative, because that's not the way the system was designed. Um, and maybe we don't even have capitalism anymore. Maybe we just have state ownership of all debt and state ownership of all assets um, on some weird level. Um, but Martin's also right that we can innovate, that we can come up with new vehicles um, like like uh, bailout funds and and like uh, bad bank holding companies and um, and like taking over AIG in the last crisis to, into a, a receivership or a protectorship, whatever they called it. And we will innovate to manage the risks going forward as to when it would happen, when the next big crisis is. I will quote a former chief economist from the Bank of England. A trend is a trend is a trend. The question is, will it end? Will it follow its course or some unforeseen force bring it come, make, make it come to an untimely end? We don't know. That's We're so far uh, off from my, my, here. Yeah. Two, two my, quick uh, questions to get in before we, we conclude, because we're running over quite a bit, but uh, very worthwhile. Um, first one really to both of you and Snapley, uh, Brexit uh, plus or minus in terms of helping the situation. Ladies first. I'll, I'll say plus if we go back to where we were 20 years ago before the tyranny of harmonization, back when London was the global wholesale capital market and unashamed of it, before we tried to adopt all of these, these um, retail market protections. Martin? When dealing size in the London market was on average 0.5%. 
uh, tens of millions of pounds for just a single trade. I'd like to go back to being a wholesale market. Okay. I think we'll be a market run by the market, led by the market in post Brexit. I think that will be a very good thing. I think the key components to focus on will be conduct all the way through and prudential. So we've got the authorities lined up. What we've got to make sure is we go back to being practitioner led by the market, good, but very close scrutiny on conduct and the prudential measures that are put in place. And final question for both of you again, um, the FSB consultation due uh, at the end of the month. Can you give me one message each that you would like to that that consultation committee to receive? And th therefore, well, Martin, I'll let you start with this one. Okay. No problem at all. I think the key message that I would be putting forward is have sufficient range of tools available and res that you can apply them in whatever circumstance you need to, ending up whereby the market can foresee the limitation of tools that you have available is in itself a flaw. So make sure that you've got maximum capacity to make appropriate changes and not be telegraphed. And something in the back pocket, good, good advice Always. in all circumstances. Kathleen? Um, well, uh, I think that there needs to be much more effort to see things in the broader context of the interdependencies, both internationally and uh, the interdependent interdependencies uh, within the market that are leading to such high and rapid levels of concentration, because concentrated markets aren't markets. They're much more fragile. They're much more easy to manipulate um, and they're much more uh, difficult to manage in a crisis. Well, thank you both. And I, I wish we did have more time to go on. And some of the issues that you're touching on, uh, both in your presentations and here, are deep systemic issues of take concentration. And we have it in so many areas, rating agencies, auditing firms. Uh, and here we, we see that it doesn't work. And yet we always seem to push that one away. Anyway, sadly, um, I'm, I'm getting a lot of uh, thanks uh, and, uh, you know, very interesting presentation comments, worthwhile and informative session comments. But you can take these another way, which is sad that we have to bring it to an end. Uh, so if I might, I'd like again to uh, three, three rounds of quick thanks, if I may. Thanks to our sponsors. As ever, your tolerance makes this a lot of fun for everybody and also very informative. Uh, I'd also like to thank the audience. Without you, there would be no point in doing this. Uh, and just to remind you that we have uh, four more webinars coming up this week. All good. Uh, I'm going to have a fascinating one tomorrow from uh, Sharon Constance on corporate governments and how can you dispute this title, why people are your board's biggest problem. Uh, there you go. And we'll be looking at uh, Beyond Investing, uh, very, very ethical, vegan, uh, anti-animal, uh, pro-animal uh, policies uh, on, on Wednesday. Uh, another session on employee share options in the COVID-19 world uh, should be absolutely fascinating, how to make good use of them. And finally, and one I'm quite excited about, we have uh, Lord Jerry Grimstone and Kate Aidy on Friday, uh, looking at our plans for building a global Britain. So a great week ahead, and I need to thank everybody for attending all of these and making them uh, useful. But I must most of all thank uh, Kathleen and Martin. I can attest to the amount of time and effort they put into what is a technical presentation. And sadly, uh, this uh, technology doesn't allow me to open up the room and let everybody give the traditional applause, but I brought my little applause meter here uh, for my Buddhist temple. And I will thank you on behalf of the entire audience for uh, for doing it. It's been really, really good. And I most appreciate you giving these very, very deep insights into an area that we all rely upon and, and all too frequently ignore. And those of you who are deep into this, along with Kathleen and Martin, uh, please take advantage of the FSB consultation. You know, write, write them that, that short letter that gets off your mind uh, what you think should be in theirs. So with that, I'm afraid I'm going to have to say goodbye to everybody. Goodbye to one and all. And thank you very much. And see you again soon. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Kathleen.